This is HEC Media. Welcome to Talking with Authors. I'm your host, Rod Milan. This is the first ever episode of Talking with Authors, where we'll be speaking with a variety of best-selling authors spanning genres. Authors like Judy Bloom, Brad Meltzer, Janet Napolitano, and so many more. HEC Media is a production company out of St. Louis, Missouri, and with the help of independent bookstore Left Bank Books and the St. Louis County Library, we are able to sit down with these amazing writers and thought leaders to discuss their work, their inspiration, and what makes them special. Also, you can watch video versions of most of these interviews by going to hecmedia.org. Today, our author is Emmy Award nominee and writer Jenna Fisher. She sat down with us for this discussion in March of 2018 at the Marriott St. Louis Grand Hotel. We'll hear how the now famous St. Louisan went from being passionate about one subject area growing up. I was fiery and outspoken, but about social justice issues. So probably people would have thought maybe that I would have gone into politics or political science. That was my focus in high school, and it wasn't in the theater production and on to becoming a star in Hollywood and landing the role of Pam Beasley in the hit TV show, The Office. She decided to write her book, The Actor's Life, A Survival Guide, to ease the path for others who might be like her growing up, finding themselves wanting to become a performer when it wasn't necessarily their original plan. There was so much that I had to learn, and I want to give that advice to young actors now. Because it's not just about being cute and talented. It's not enough, you know, you have to have a good business sense. Interviews with authors from HEC Media and HEC Books. Here's our host, Angie Weidinger. First, just welcome back to St. Louis. Thank you, thanks so much. When you come to town, do you find that there are so many friends and family, there's just not enough time? I think we all feel like that when we go home. There's never enough time, and a lot of times when I come to St. Louis, it's for an event or a special occasion, and so, so much of the time and energy go into that special occasion. So, for example, the reason that I'm here for this trip was because my niece just celebrated her first communion, and I'm her godmother, and so, because of that, then I don't necessarily have time to have dinner with all my old high school friends. Or It just times out perfectly that you're here promoting your book as well, right? Yeah, so I just had a book come out, and the book is literally about my journey from St. Louis to Hollywood. I graduated with a theater degree, and I went out to Hollywood, and I thought, I'm a trained actor. I think I've got some natural talent. I've got my Nerex Hall grit. Um, I'm going to make it in six months. And it was, it was all, not six months. I mean, six months later, I was actually in debt, barely had a day job, didn't have an agent, had horrible headshots. So there was so much that I had to learn about the process and the behind the scenes aspect of how the Hollywood business machine works. And I want to give that advice to young actors now. And I also want to help, I, I think it's a great book for parents to read if they have a kid right. who might want to go into acting because I think it could help parents kind of show, direct their kids in a more realistic way. Because it's not just about being like cute and talented. It's not enough, you know. You have to have a good business sense, I think, in order to really make your way. Well, and, and also helping them understand what you're wanting, because I think you wrote that your parents talked you into getting a minor in journalism because they thought, oh, well, that way you can just, you can be on TV. Yes. I, I think a lot of people think that actors like the showy part of the job, that the reason we became actors is because we're show-offs or we were the class clown or we like um, being in front of the camera. But most actors I know are very shy, are introverts. I'm an introvert. Um, I don't like being the center of attention. I like being at a small, intimate dinner party with people I know very well, much more than a big party. Um, I didn't go to a single fraternity or sorority party when I was in college. Um, that would give me social anxiety. So for me, the thing that I love about acting is actually turning into other people, into figuring out how to replicate feelings of 
love, of shame, of jealousy in a realistic way and tell a story. So yeah, so I think when my parents were like, oh, get a minor in journalism because then you could be on TV. It's like, well, that in no way scratches the itch. You know, that is in no way what I love about acting. I love acting so much that I would want to continue to do it no matter what the venue. So even if it didn't get attached to fame and success, you know, my goal was really just to make a living doing what I loved. And I did that for many years. For many years, I was an anonymous actor who popped up in various roles, and that's how I made my living, but nobody knew who I was. And, and that's you kind of debunking those myths kind of throughout your book. I mean, I think you, you even wrote that you know, if you're going into it for fame and fortune, you have the Screen Actors Guild, the median acting income is 52000 a year. And you don't get to keep $52,000 right. a year. Right. You have to give 10% to your agent, 10% to your manager. Then you have to give away your money to taxes. And that is what the average working union actor makes per year. So you have to love it. You have to love it. Only something like 5% of working actors make over $100,000 a year. Now you know those things. But back then, like you said, is it something that you wish you kind of had had that to go, okay, it's fine, everything's fine? Well, you know, because, um, you know, there are certain union rules. So um, a union actor who does a big starring guest role on a television show, that would be like, you know, you come on for one episode. Their base pay, you have to get paid $6,000. So when you see that number, when I saw that number, I thought, $6,000 for a week? That's amazing. But what you don't realize is you only get three of those jobs a year. Right. You know, you don't, you're not earning $6,000 right. every single week. But when you get your paycheck, the government thinks you are. So they take out taxes as if you are earning $6,000 a week. Now you'll get a return at the end of the year. This is the nitty gritty, folks. <laughs> this is not what you thought. And this is it. People think that Hollywood and being an actor is parties and red carpets and schmoozing, and it's not, it is a business, it is a small business like any small business. I mean, even for those of us not in Hollywood, it's really interesting to see what sets are like. I mean, you talk about the food. Oh, yes. Because of the us. The food. I talk a lot about food in my book. You do. Um, because. <laughs> not in a good way. It's not appetizing. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes, I will say one of the best parts about being an actor is there is tons of free food. When you go on sets, they have a morning buffet. They've got a lunch buffet. And these buffets, if you're on like a television production or a mo big movie production, these things rival a Vegas buffet. I mean, there's a carving station. You've got wow. seafood. You've got chicken. So there, you will eat. And then the irony is that actors never eat, you right. know, because we all have to stay a little teeny size to be on camera. So there's tons of food surrounding you. It's really torture. But as a starving artist, I would go and try to figure out all the ways that I could take food home. So I'd work one day on a set, and I'd leave with a little to-go packet because that was the best food I could get. That was, the, you know, the best way to eat. But then when you're in a scene, when you're working and you see people eating dinner in a scene, that food is gross. <laughs> so the food surrounding you is good, but the food when you're actually working is gross. So if you have to eat chicken parmesan in a scene, it's cold. So they cook it and then they make it really cold so that throughout the day, as it warms up under the lights, it doesn't make you sick. Right. And so when, and it takes hours to shoot a dinner scene. And so you just keep getting that same plate of food kind of back in front of you. So I always say if they give you a choice of what you'd like to eat in a scene, just say salad. Not steak. Don't you say said steak. That, yeah. Yeah, when I was a, a starving artist, the first time I got to work in a dinner scene, they asked me what I wanted. It was at a restaurant and they said, just pick something off the menu. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm so hungry. And I said, can I have steak and potatoes? And they said, oh yeah, sure. Well, then they served me cold steak and cold potatoes all day. And it was, <laughs> no, this is I bad. was like, oh, shoot. Yeah. That's not what I was hoping for. <laughs> well, and, and you have a lot of funny things that have happened to you that, I mean, you're not afraid of self-deprecating moments in your book. I mean, there's a lot that, I mean, most people have probably gone, you know, I'd rather forget about those things, but you wrote them down. <laughs> well, you know, that's funny. I have a friend who's a writer, and I actually quote him in the book, and he said, one of the problems with our industry is that people never, there's a term, they never show their brush strokes. Mm. So you see the final masterpiece of the painting and you think it just came out of the person like that. 
or a script. You think it just poured out of them or an acting performance. But the truth is there were so many brush strokes, so many mistakes, so many wrong places where we put color and then had to fix it. There's so many corrections along the way before you get to the final masterpiece. So my book was the attempt to show all the brush strokes, to show all my mistakes that hopefully people can learn from, that I learned from, because I didn't just land in Los Angeles. And not only did I not have the opportunities to get on a television show the minute I landed there, I wasn't ready to be on a television show. And that's a big message of the book, which is that you need seasoning. You need to learn how to be on a set. You need to learn the etiquette. You need to learn how to perform for a camera. You need to learn how to endure the days, which have a lot of changes. I talk about in the book, I had a situation where um, I had this very long speech that I had to give, a medical speech. And so I memorized it, memorized it, memorized it. And I was so confident that I was bragging on set that I was gonna, we were gonna be finished early because I was so prepared. Well, I missed an email where they sent me a rewrite of that speech. So when the camera started rolling, I launched into my speech and the director said, oh, Jenna, did you not get the rewrite? And I thought he was kidding with me. I thought he was, you know, yeah. joking because I'd been bragging. Right, right. And I said, oh, ha ha, come on, come on, let's do it. And he goes, no, we had some clearance issues and we had to rewrite it and it's completely different. And the whole crew is there ready to shoot and then I wasn't prepared. So I talk about that, I talk about read every email when you get to work, confirm you're really doing the scenes, confirm you have the right material. Things change all the time. Coming up later, we'll hear more about Jenna's life in show business, both funny and scary. I didn't know that you shouldn't go to auditions in people's apartments. I mean, something horrible could have happened to me. I'm just lucky, frankly. And we'll hear Jenna read a snippet from her book as well, when Talking With Authors continues from HEC Media. Educate Today offers an ever-growing library of the highest quality video resources, curriculum materials, and interactive programs, all of which are designed to challenge thinking, inspire creativity, and empower learning of students, educators, parents, and lifelong learners. And you can find out more about all these programs by going online to educate.today. That's educate.today. The, the friends that you made when you got out there, I think you write a lot of them left after two years. So like, you know what, this is too much, it's too hard. Yeah. But you stuck it out. Is there some, what's the message of tenacity that, I mean, any of us in any industry could use there and maybe even in the future that you hope your children can see if they were to read this book, you know, yeah. as they're looking for a career. You know, when you go to those ball games and you're down, like remember the World Series, St. Louis, right? <laughs> right? David Freeze, right? Did we think we were going to get out of that game? It happens. Why can't it happen to you? If you can wait it out, I don't know. That's me, though. Like I'm the girl who would sit on the courthouse steps for nine years to get my law passed and just break people down by just waiting them out. Um, you know, there's a lot you can do by just refusing to leave. And there's lots of examples where the success came later in life. Every market is very saturated with like 21 year olds who want to go out in the world and like start that career and especially with acting. But if you're in your 30s, a lot of the people leave. So I always tell <laughs> actors, it, stick around because the competition goes down, you know, <laughs> if you wait it out. Um, but also I think if you don't love it, if you don't need it, if it isn't like oxygen to you, be something else. Uh, you give a lot of advice in your book about what to take with you to auditions, what to do to prepare for auditions. You have in there what you should always bring when you go for a fitting for a role. And you talk about undergarments, blue jeans. You don't mention a shirt, which I wondered then. I saw you on Jimmy Kimmel in your <laughs> towel, but you had your jeans on. Obviously, undergarments. So is that what happened? I there? should have. <laughs> yes. No. So what happened was... Um, I was backstage and getting ready and sort of luxuriating. And I had this strappy kind of jumpsuit mm -hmm. and I had put on a towel with my jeans because they had to put makeup and lotion on my arms. 
So I'm sitting back there in a towel and they bring around snacks and it was five o'clock and I was hungry. And I was like, oh, I've got plenty of time. I've got plenty of time. Well, then when it was time, they, they were like, you're up next, get dressed. I'm like, okay, okay. I go to get dressed and just like uh, with the zipper. And of course I had worn a shirt to Jimmy Kimmel, but someone said, I was like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Like, what do we, oh, what do we do? Oh my God. Oh my God. And someone said, um, just wear the towel. It looks adorable. And I, so the choice was towel, just go big and wear the towel and make a story out of it or frumpy shirt that I wore in (laughs) from the street, which then is sort of like, why are you wearing that horrible t-shirt, that frumpy t-shirt? So I, I went with towel. It's because, you know, we watch people at home watch that and they're like, oh, that was a stunt. That was not a stunt. It was it was a stunt in the sense that, like, probably we could have figured something out. But in the moment, it was a frenzy and they mic'd the towel. And it was like, probably we could have gotten it on somehow. But I was a little panicked. I hadn't left I had enough time. And it was like, just go with it. Just go with it. But it was not planned. That was not like I came from home. Like we're going to do this plan thing. to wear it. No. And I'm sure, I feel like you can tell I'm a little shaking. And I was really, ner- I had to really be like, okay, okay. I can't believe I'm about to do this. I can't believe I'm about to do this. And I was like, okay, okay. So it was a little bit, like, it was a little scary, oh my but I made it through. Well, I couldn't tell you were nervous. That's why I thought, oh, oh that was a no. Oh, I was like. So that, it worked. <sighs> yeah, I guess. I, you know, because I was like, well, maybe if I walk out and I just like have my hand down and we can get it on and it'll be okay. And, but it was, there was a time thing too. It was so, like, you're next, you're next, you're next. So that's the addendum. Like if you're, if you're in a hurry, don't sweat it. You can always wear a towel. That's the addendum to the yeah, book, right? Yeah, just go big. <laughs> I think a little bit is like, just go big just and have it. fun with it. Roll with it. Yeah. You touched a little while ago about Nearings Hall and going to school there. I mean, you just said you weren't the class clown, you weren't the extrovert, but I would have expected you to be the lead role of the shows. I mean, that's what I envisioned opening up a book and seeing pictures of you in all these lead roles. That is not... No, there's actually four pictures of me in the dance chorus <laughs> right. Of in high school. Yeah. I never had a lead role. In college, I was not in a single main stage show. I only got cast in the lab productions that were like student run productions, but they were the best ones. And the best education came from that because nobody gives you lead roles when you land in Hollywood. You have to do it yourself. You have to create your own work. You have to band together with your friends, get your own experience. You have to be a person who can generate work for yourself in this business and all through the business. I, that never goes away. And so the best thing that I got from my, I went to Truman State, was the fact that no one gave me a lead role because I had to decide that it didn't matter and that I was going to get in my own productions. I was going to make my own way. Now at Nerex, I was... Um, I was fiery and outspoken, but about social justice issues. So um, probably people at Narex would have thought maybe that I would have gone into maybe politics or political science. I was very big on the ways in which advertising had like subliminal messaging that kept women down. Like I gave presentations on that in school. So like that was my like focus in high school a little bit more in terms of where I broke out of my shy shell, and it wasn't in like the theater productions. Do you ever feel like you want to keep doing any of that, or is that is um, that high school, Jenna, and and or do you have some of that? No, I mean I carry that with me all the time. You know, we've we've uh, we have this Me Too movement that's right. going on right now, right? And um, something that I got from Narex was the fearlessness to speak up. I just always say like. Don't mess with an Eric's girl and don't tell an Eric's girl she can't do something, you know, because we don't, we don't put up with that. Because you brought up the Me Too thing. I mean, you never had, did you have, I mean, there's so many stories from Hollywood. I know you talk about where you were in a situation where you went to a couple places that could have been kind of dangerous, like a, that was a high price call. Call girl ring. Yes, yes. I know that's a completely (laughs) different situation. That's such a hard story to tell in this interview. But yes, no, there was a, um, I feel like I have to tell it now that you said that. Because it kind of opens Um, the door. It does. No, I didn't know that you shouldn't go to auditions in people's apartments. I mean, something horrible could have happened to me. I'm just lucky, frankly. That's not being an Eric's girl. That's just luck that 
you know, nothing happened to me when I, but then as soon as I did, I realized you're not supposed to do that. No, there was a call for uh, an all girls singing group, an open call. And I went with my friend and we waited in line and it seemed legitimate. And then I got cast in the singing group. Which you're not a singer. I'm not a singer. But I thought, well, Madonna's not a singer. I must have a lot of (laughs) charisma, of course. No, what I had was I looked, I was an easy target. You know, I was naive. And um, it turned out that what it was was a singing group that was actually an escort service. And um, as soon as I figured that out, I was out there. I kept wondering why we weren't having rehearsals. (laughs) I would say, I haven't learned any of my harmonies. I do not feel prepared. And um, it turns out you didn't actually have to sing at the gigs. So... Did you tell your parents these stories? Gosh, I can't remember if I told them that story. I didn't want them to worry. Right. I mean... But... um, I can't remember. Well, now they know because they read right. the book. But, <laughs> um, but no, I mean, that could have really been a scary situation. Now, you know, that's a little different than the Me Too movement. Right. I, the, I've experienced sexual harassment in other industries, not in Hollywood. When I was working as a secretary for many years, I had a coworker who at the Christmas party got drunk and lifted up my skirt in front of everyone and showed them my underwear. Hmm. And I filed a complaint. I think that I was scared. I could have been, I felt like I could have been fired. This was, you know, I was a secretary. This was an executive. Um, And I think one of the things that gave me the courage to file the complaint was that I almost didn't care if I would be fired because (laughs) I was like, I don't want this job anyway, but I'll tell you what you're not going to do to women, you know, but if, if I needed that job for my livelihood and it was the only thing I had, that's why women have a hard time speaking up because, you know, they... They feel trapped, right? you know, and people in general who are experiencing harassment. So I've experienced that in life like I think any woman who walks on this earth has experienced it. And it's not exclusive to Hollywood. It's in every industry. And what I'm hoping will happen now is a cultural shift, a shift where we believe people when we speak, when they speak up, where we say it's important that you've spoken up and it's important that we change this. That's what I'm hoping we'll see. So I have to ask, I know you were joking, you jokingly said in the book that people should pick up your next book, How to Stop Being Annoying. That was in one <laughs> yeah. of our, but I mean, have you thought about writing another book and if you, like what it might be about or is this um, it? I haven't. I mean, I've had this idea stuck in my craw, seriously, since I got to LA, I'd be like, why isn't there a handbook for people? Where can I get advice? Where why is there not someone book? in the industry telling people how to do this? Yeah. This is ridiculous. So I felt like I was, I'm solving a problem, in my opinion. I'm just like trying to like fill a void. So um, I, I don't know, maybe if there was something in conjunction with this, but not right now, no. This is, is it, it. it's one book. It took quite some time, seven years? From the time I first had the idea and first told my manager about it, it was seven years before the book was published. So again, I mean, it's like, I didn't just sit down and write a book and then a book came out. So if people are wanting to read more of yours or see more of you, I mean, you're, gonna, you're in ABC sitcom Splitting Up Together where you play Lena. Yes. And so I finally went back to television. I took a long break. The office has been off the air for five years. And um, I've done a lot of things in that time, but a little bit more um, maybe off the big television radar. I did a play in New York, and then I was in the world premiere of Steve Martin's new comedy Meteor Shower, which moved to Broadway, but I didn't move to Broadway. Amy Schumer did a very good job on Broadway. And I I wanted to do that theater because I just think part of being an artist is making yourself scared again and not just doing the thing you think you're the best at. So I did some theater, which was terrifying, but I did it, and I'm really proud of that. And then I did a television show that was in London. Again, I thought, I want to get out of the American television system. Let's go live in London. Let's do a television show in London. And that was an amazing experience. And then finally, now, and I had two babies in that time too. (laughs) Now everybody's in school and I decided to, those were all short-term jobs, which are great for being a mom, like uh, being a parent, just part-time, you know, a set amount of time and it's over. So a television show, you sign a seven-year contract and so it could go on and on. So I didn't want to kind of take that on again until I felt like as a family, we were all ready, but I did. And it 
I could not be more excited. So the show is splitting up together. That was such a long preamble. <laughs> it's okay. But, um, <laughs> it's so good. the show is splitting up together. It's for ABC. It stars me and Oliver Hudson, and we play a couple who's recently divorced who is still trying to co-parent and raise our kids. And one of us lives in the detached garage each week, and the other lives in the house with the kids. So the idea is the kids don't pack a bag and go to different houses. The parent packs a bag and just sort of goes in the garage. So we're still kind of on top of each other, navigating a divorce and kids and running a household. And this is something that people are actually doing, I've read. Yes, it's called bird nesting. Crazy. I've never, I didn't know that. That's yes. really interesting. Yes. And this character, Lena, I've, I've read somewhere that you guys have some issues together, some control, spontaneity issues. Um, that you you mean issues of being terrific? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we do. Um, no, it's interesting. I felt like Pam was such a great role for me because it was such an expression of where I was at that time, which was I was literally working as a receptionist hoping that something would come along that where I could live an artistic life. I mean, that's Pam. Pam wanted to be a painter, but she was working as a receptionist and not really having my full voice yet artistically or even as a woman. And so it all really was perfect. And Pam's journey of finding her voice was very similar to my journey on that show. But I have to say, now I'm not that person anymore, right? I'm married. I have two kids. I have this whole other sort of part of me that is as much me, but that has so far gone unexpressed. So now I get to express it in this character. And that is the person who runs a household, who makes lists, who <laughs> plans ahead, who, um, who speaks up, you know? That was one part of Pam that was the most different from me, which is that it would not, if I had a crush on Jim, it would not take that long for him to know. <laughs> And if I wanted something, it would not take me that long to, to speak it. It might, it takes a long time to achieve things, but I'm far more driven than Pam. And that part of my personality gets to come out in this character. And I get to make fun of that part of myself, and I get to amplify that part of myself. Jenna Fisher talking about her new roles and what she has coming up in the future. To close out our podcast, here's Jenna reading an excerpt from her book, the Actor's Life, A Survival Guide. At some point in my formative years, it dawned on me that an acting career wouldn't happen in St. Louis. There were only a handful of movies filmed there my entire childhood, among them American Flyers, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, and For You Trivia Buffs, Escape from New York. But the idea of moving from St. Louis to Los Angeles or New York was daunting and scary. Hollywood in particular seemed like a million miles away, almost like another country with its own customs and currency. And if I was able to somehow get to Tinseltown, how would I even begin to break into show business? I didn't know anyone. No fancy connections, no idea how the business worked. Nonetheless, after college, I collected my theater degree, packed up my Mazda 323 hatchback, and along with my cat Andy, started on the long journey from St. Louis to Los Angeles. Author and Emmy-nominated actor Jenna Fisher, reading from her book, The Actor's Life, A Survival Guide, from our interview with her in March of 2018. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Talking With Authors. Remember, you can watch all of these interviews online at hecmedia.org. Also, be sure to follow us on social media. Just search for Talking With Authors on all social media platforms. And if you haven't done so yet, please rate and review this program wherever you get your podcasts. The host and producer of this episode of Talking With Authors was Angie Weidinger, Video editor and graphics were by Greg Kopp. Supervising producer was Julie Winkle. Photography was by Spot Media Production Group. And production support by Jane Ballou and Christina Chastain. HEC Media Executive Director is Dennis Riggs. The podcast executive producer is Christina Chastain. Podcast editors were Ben Smith and Rod Milam. And I'm Rod Milam, your podcast host. We'll see you next time on Talking with Authors. This is HEC Media.